Now this is a sign-up sheet to prepare communion trays for Sunday. It says it takes about one hour to prepare and one hour to clean up. You can sign up either as a family or individual to do this. I'll pass this around with a pen, and I'd like to get this pen back because that belongs to my wife, not me. So if you can be interested in helping with that, and just let that pass all the way around, and then uh, Mike will pick that up after class. <laughs> you got me again, Ed. Yes. <laughs> Okay, tonight we're in Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> it's unusual that uh, we end one lesson and begin another. It's going to be on a, the beginning of a chapter. We're usually right in the middle somewhere. So uh, Matthew chapter 17. Uh, and this is going to all be about the transfiguration. Uh, I want to look at these first few verses of it. When we get all 13, we just read the first four verses of this uh, to get started in this. Uh, text says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to him, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, this reading is from the uh, New King James, what I usually use here. Uh, I do have a New King James, but I didn't bring it with me tonight, so if I'm reading for anything else, it'll be from a different translation. But this is New King James that's given here. Uh, the Bible tells us this was six days after Jesus' discussions with his disciples about the establishment of the church. Back in chapter 16, uh, Jesus had uh, asked the disciples who men thought they were, who he was, and then what they thought. And upon the confession of Peter, uh, Jesus made this promise upon this rock, upon the truth that you just confessed, that I will establish my church. Now, six days after that, he leads three of these disciples up on a, a high mountain. Uh, we believe probably that mountain is, is likely going to be Mount Hermon. And uh, there, there are a couple of reasons why. Uh, the Bible says that it was a high mountain. And the mountain that's normally uh, given by people is to the mountain where this took place. Is only about 1,500 to 1,900 feet high. Mount Hermon is much, much higher than that. We want to look at, if you look at a mountain, remember now in chapter 16, Jesus and them had come to that area of Caesarea, of Philippi. And that's where they'd been. And that's not too far from Mount Hermon. In fact, it almost extends all the way down to that. And, and if you look at a picture of Mount Hermon, it's kind of hard to tell here on the screen uh, because you can't see the top of the mountain. You can just see some outlines of it maybe up toward the top, but it's because it's snow-covered. Uh, and that gives you some idea of how high this mountain is. Like I said, it's, it's better than 9,000 feet high. And so since that's in the vicinity of where Christ was at, uh, and this is a high mountain, as the Bible talks about it, this may very likely be the place where Jesus is taking his disciples and where he's transfigured before them. Now, when the Bible says that he was transfigured, what does that mean? Anybody have an idea about the, the word transfigured? Or he's changed. But in what sense is he changed? Now, this is the problem that comes up. The, the word that's used here by him, the word that's translated transfigured, uh, is a word that used to suggest a change in form. Uh, we kind of talked about this before. There are a couple of Greek words for this, for form. And one means, you know, uh, that, you, that you can change, like what Zappa was given, like a, when a child is born, okay? As that child goes through the different stages on up to adulthood, it's still a man, it's still a male. That hasn't changed. But his shape has changed. Maybe other things are going to change, hair color or hair loss, whatever, through the years, that's going to change. But it's still, essentially, it's a person, it's a man. But the other... It is a change that indicates a change in being uh, of, of some sort. So, the word that's used here is the word, the word metamorpho. 
Uh, we get our English word metamorphosis from that. And what does metamorphosis mean? Wait. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's metamorphosis. Yeah, that caterpillar weaves a cocoon and comes out a butterfly. And that's the word that's used here, the metamorphosis of it. Uh, and so, you know, that's also the way we are to change. You know, the Bible tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Uh, and so we're not to be like the world, we're to be different from the world. There's a metamorphosis, a change. Uh, we're still humans, but we change in our relationship to God. Uh, we stop living in sin, we start living the way God wants us to live. So that's that type of change. And so uh, it implies, the first part of that meta implies change, and the word morpho uh, is the Greek word for form. Uh, if you look in Luke's account of it, Luke uh, words it a little bit differently. Uh, Luke says uh, that he was altered. He became different. And so the, the reason may be why, because many of the ancient world, when they would hear that word metamorphosis, they, they applied that to their gods that would change into different forms uh, that, that might appear in one form one time, another form another way. And so they didn't want, they feel like, you know, that maybe uh, Matthew... Uh, can explain that that's okay writing if you are to the Jews they would understand about this uh, that, that, that Christ uh, the change that goes places he's not changing into a different being or something like it. it's the same one but Luke is writing to Greeks and the Greeks worship all manner of gods now, they had a number of idols that they worshiped and so writing to them if you use that word metamorphosis, it might, to their mind, think, okay, he's like our gods, you know, that's changing, becoming a different being altogether, which is not the case. <clears throat> so anyhow, he's changed. And, and the idea, he says, that his face and his clothing began to shine. His face was shining like the sun, and his clothes were white as light. Uh, and so the, the, the great difference here, and I want us to look at this for just a minute. Uh, when it talks about him being transfigured before them. Uh, Luke's account seems to suggest that this happened at night. Why? What, what does Luke say that would suggest this is happening at night? Well, look over in Luke chapter 9, at verse 32. If you don't have your Bibles with I do think I have that on the screen here, yeah. It says, but Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men who stood with him. So the fact that they are heavy with sleep would seem to suggest this is probably at night. Uh, they've had a long day and they're tired. And they've just gone up on this mountain. I don't know how far if they went all the way up to the top of 9,000 feet. You know they're tired. Uh, so it may have been at night, though. And, and they're, they're heavy with sleep. And then it says, when they were fully awake, that's when they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. <clears throat> and so maybe it's, if, if it was at night, just think of the difference that would make with Christ beginning to shine like this. I mean, at night, it would just stand out even more than it would in the daytime, especially when you think his face is becoming brighter than the sun. What did, what did the Bible say about Christ when he appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus? Bright as the noonday sun. You know, and so that, that's what's happening here is he's being transfigured before them. And in Luke's account of it says there, it says, when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. Now the word glory there, dox, doxa, is used a number of times in the Bible. But you look in the Old Testament when it talks about the glory of God. Uh, the Shekinah, the shining. He appeared as a pillar of light or fire to guide them during the night when they were going through the wilderness. And so the glory here of God, uh, they saw Christ in His glory. And uh, maybe, you know, it's talked about His face is shining like the sun, His clothing was bright, uh, like it had been clean with fuller soap or something, you know, just remarkably clean. But it may be that all that's happening here is that the glory of God is showing through the robe that Jesus has on. And so the brightness of the sea and the clothing may be, you know, the result of His glory shining through Him, that they see this. And they also saw the two men that appeared with Him. 
Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus talking with him. And so it's interesting here, you look at this, that they appeared with him talking with them. There are two possibilities. How did they know that this is Moses and Elijah? And Moses and Elijah died long before these disciples were born. Uh, there were no pictures uh, to be shown around so they could identify. How would they know that this is Moses and Elijah? I mean, it's speculation, but I think there's at least a couple of ways that that come, come, come about. All right, whatever they're talking about, you know, and the conversation back and forth, it may have been mentioned. You know, Jesus may have referred to, to Moses, may have referred to Elijah. Uh, another possibility is that it, it simply may have been made known to them that this is who it is. You know, that God made it known to those two men, or those three disciples, that this is who it is. Uh, you know, and I think, what's it going to be like when we're in heaven? You know, I hear people like, well, I want to talk to Paul. I've got some questions I want to ask Paul. Well, how are you going to know who Paul is? You've never seen him. You don't know what he looks like. But I believe that in heaven we will recognize these people. That, that somehow we will know who they are. And maybe that's all that is here. That they're made to recognize who they are. And so <clears throat> there's Moses and Elijah. And the, and the text says, and Matthew says, that they were talking with him. But what were they talking about? And to understand that again, you have to go to the book of Luke. Because Luke reveals that to us. So, again... Uh, this is in Luke chapter 9 and, and verse 31. It says, Who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, there, there, there are a couple of things about this that I wanted to, to, to notice to point out. First of all, they're, they're talking about Jesus' death, his decease. Uh, but it's interesting that the word that he uses here is not the normal Greek word for death. The normal word would be thanatos. Uh, that's used over and over again in the Bible about death, someone dying. Uh, but when it talks about Jesus' decease, it uses a different word. Have any idea what that word might have been? It's a word you'd be familiar with when you heard it. Huh? Exodus. You know, that's the word he used. They were talking about his exodus. And so that's intriguing to me Do you think about that. The word exodus simply means a way out. And so they're talking about his way out of this world. Uh, when Paul talked about his death and writing to Timothy, Paul says, the time of my departure is at hand. He describes his death as a departure. And the word that he uses there, analusis, is a word that means to be loosed from. And we've talked about this before. Uh, it, it's, it was a word that would be used of loosing an animal from the yoke so that it could rest at the end of the day, uh, unloosing uh, the mooring lines that hold the ship to shore so it can sail out across the seas. Uh, it's used of the lines on a tent uh, to keep it tethered down or loosen that so one can move on. And so it was used in a variety of ways, and Paul sees that as, as a description of his death. He's fixing to be loose from this world uh, to go to the next. But for Jesus, he's talking about his exodus. Now, what was the exodus in the Old Testament? All right, leaving the land of Egypt, going where? To the promised land. Jesus is talking about his exodus. He's going to be leaving this world. And where is he going? To the real promised land. He's going back to heaven. Back to his home. And so it's intriguing to me. Is that they use this word exodus. To describe Christ's death. His departure from this world. Uh, leading the way. From this land to that promised land. That God has promised for us. And so Moses led the Jews on that grand exodus from bondage to Egypt to the promised land, and Christ is going to be leading his people from this land to the real promised land of heaven itself. Now, something else I want to think about here. Why are Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus about his death? Of what concern is that to them? Maybe to offer some comfort to him about or encouragement to him about what's coming up. But why would they be interested in his death? Sir? 
Okay. He's dying in order that sins can be forgiven. You've got to remember the people that lived under the Old Testament law were never, did not have their sins removed until Christ died. Uh, the sins of, of, of their people, you know, every year they're making those sacrifices, the animal sacrifices to God. But that didn't take away sins. And, and the New Testament emphasized that. It says that it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. And so we talk about those sins being rolled forward, as it were, but there was a remembrance being made of those sins every year, and that's why they had to make those sacrifices again and again and again. But it's only when Christ comes and He dies on the cross that the final sacrifice, the only sacrifice that made that can take away those sins. And so Moses and Elijah are concerned about that because whether or not they're going to be able to dwell eternally in heaven with God is going to determine about whether or not Christ carries out you know, God's plan, and he's put to death in order that sins might be forgiven. And his blood was the only means of having their sins finally taken away. Uh, you look in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, when it talks about how that, that God overpassed their sins, you know, of the past. Uh, used to, we could use this, and I've always used it as an example. Uh, it's not the same anymore. But if you write a check to pay off a debt, and you give them that check. You know, I used to do this all the time at uh, stores. Write out a check and give them that check. And they let me walk out with that merchandise. That's considered paid for. But they don't have the money yet. That check has got to be turned into the bank where I have my account. And money is withdrawn out of my account and put into their account. Well, used to, that take two or three days, you know. Sometimes it might take even longer before that was done. As soon as they got the check, they counted it as forgiven, but the debt wasn't forgiven until they got the cash. And so when these men in the Old Testament made these animal sacrifices, God accounted their sins as being forgiven, but it wasn't. He was passing over that until the time that Christ died, and finally the debt would be canceled, and they would be forgiven. And so that's what's happening. That's why they're interested in it. Right. Not until he died were they forgiven. Uh, like I said, you know, the Hebrew writer talks about it. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But then he says, you know, that the blood, it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And so they had to wait for Christ's death. And that's why we ought to be interested in the death of Jesus. And, and, the, and the things that we're talking about on Sundays about the cross and about his death. Because all of our salvations is dependent upon that. You know, if that doesn't take place, if Jesus, and he could have opted out of it if he wanted to, and God could have changed his mind if he wanted to, but if we were going to be saved, the only way it was possible was by his death. And we ought to be interested in the death of Christ and remember it as we did tonight and this morning in the, uh, uh, the feast here of, of unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine remind us of the body and the blood of Christ and his death for us. Yes, sir, Willie. Now, now his, his preaching to them, uh, the text goes on explains that was through, you know, Noah. He was a preacher of righteousness. He preached to those people. Those who rejected him are now in, in Hades. They're in the, the Taurus part of it, the suffering. Christ didn't really go there. But he preached to them through Noah. Uh, Jesus went into Hades, but you have to keep in mind, Hades is divided the place of paradise and the place of Tartarus, of suffering. And Christ would have gone to the place of paradise. We'll talk about that hopefully in a couple of weeks. Uh, well, next week we'll talk about the promise that he made uh, to that one thief on the cross. Today you shall be with me in paradise. That's the second word of Christ spoken from the cross. <clears throat> if you want to get a little ahead of time next week, the first prayer, the first word of Christ was a prayer. The second word of Christ was the answer to a prayer. You know, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And verily I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. That's the answer to a prayer. And uh, hope to be able to talk about that much more next week. So anyhow, that, that's the situation here. They were interested in the death of Christ because their salvation is dependent upon it. We should be interested in it because our salvation is dependent upon it. Uh, 
And then Peter, uh, as normal, is quick to speak up. And Peter's the one that, oh, I forgot I'd put all this on there. Uh, Peter suggests, let's build three booths, three tabernacles. And, uh, and, you know, if you think about it, I can understand Peter's emotion in that and wanting to do that because you've got Moses and Elijah here uh, along with Christ. You know, you couldn't have an assemblage of three greater people uh, as far as the Jews are concerned than these three men. And so you feel like Peter would want to honor these people. And so let's build three tabernacles. We'll build one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. Now, when you look at Mark's account of it, I think it's in Mark chapter 9, verse 6. I don't show that on the screen, but if you want to look at it. Uh, according to Mark, why did Peter say this? Someone will turn over to Mark chapter 9 and verse 6. <clears throat> All right, go ahead and read that for us. Okay. You ever been in a situation like that when you feel like you need to say something, you don't know what it is that you need to say, and you just blurt out something? Uh, and, and, and that may have been it was with him, you know, that uh, he's, he's frightened by what they've seen, and he feels like he ought to say something, you know, you just can't sit there in silence and say, well, well what do you think? What does this mean to you? So he just comes out with a suggestion. Let's build three tabernacles to honor each of you, Moses, Elijah, and Christ. Uh, but there's also, some have expressed, and I think, could, could certainly be true that, excuse the pun here, but this is a mountaintop experience. And I think that's probably where this expression comes from. Uh, a mountaintop experience is something that you've had those times in your life when something was so exciting, so pleasing, so enjoyable, you just wished it would never end. And maybe that's the way Peter's thinking here on this occasion. So uh, let's take the time to build three booths. You know, he, he's not ready to go back down off the mountain yet. He's having a, a wonderful time here. This is a marvelous thing. You know, he, he has seen Christ being glorified, and he's seen the two greatest men in the Old Testament appearing with him. You know, nobody else in, in, Mos or in these disciples' life has seen Moses and Elijah, but they've had the privilege of seeing him there along with Christ. So he doesn't want that to happen. Uh, and there, there have been times in our lives, there have been things that have been so exciting and so enjoyable, we wish it could never end. But reality is it has to end. There has to be times when we come down from that mountain. And as Jordan talked about it in his lesson last Wednesday night, you know, uh, you know, it's good to be up on the mountaintop and have those experiences. But the reality is we've got to be out down in the valley uh, helping those people that are having problems and doing what we can to reach out to them, to encourage and help them, and to bring them into a closer relationship with God. And, and some of the work that's involved is not always easy, uh, and it's not always pleasurable because you have to go through a lot of heartbreak yourself in doing that. But it's something we've got to be willing to do. And then you've got to remember uh, that that's not intended for this life. Heaven is the place where you're going to be filled with joy and excitement, and it's never going to end. That's a mountaintop experience that will always be there for all eternity. So, why have mountaintop experiences here? What's the purpose of that? Why do you think Jesus wanted these three apostles to be there and to experience this? To, yeah, it, it, that they're going to be the leaders. I think that's the reason why these three were chosen to do that. And what was it you did? Encouragement to them. And that's exactly what I believe it's all about is encouragement. You know, because they're going to have to go back down to the valley. And as soon as they go down there, there's going to be trouble. And I believe for all of us in life, when we have these mountaintop experiences, the reason for that, the purpose behind it, is to encourage us to get down uh, to where we need to be and, and to work out these problems. Uh, and to help prepare us for that. Yeah. Right, yeah. And for the Jewish people, that, that's really going to hit home with them. Uh, and be impressive to them and, and make them more mindful of this. So, you know, we just need to learn, as Peter and them need to learn, you know, 
uh, it's great to have these kind of experiences, but it's to help prepare us for the hard times to come and to get ready uh, to do the work that God wants us to do. And so, but, but look at these three men that he's talked about wanting to be on fire. First of all, uh, there, there's Moses. Well, I keep forgetting about this. There we go. Moses. Uh, now, when you think of Moses, what's the first thing you think about? <laughs> the Red Sea. That's part of the deliverance from Egyptian bondage. The lawgiver. You know, that, that Old Testament law that was given by him, uh, by God through him. Uh, he was the one that got to go up on the mountain and get those two tables of stone written with the finger of God. Uh, and to me, that's significant. You know, uh, you talk about it. it's written by the very finger of God uh, that he's given. Uh, and he becomes the one through whom God gives the law. And it's been estimated there are about 613 different laws in the Old Testament that are given. And, and whenever you talk about the law, most of the times you talk about it's the law of Moses. Sometimes people might say the Old Testament law, but most times people say it's the law of Moses. And so Moses is one who's well known and well respected by the Jews because it's through him that God has delivered that law for the Jewish people. God has given his revelation to them, and that in itself is a great blessing. Paul lists that as one of the great blessings that God gave the Jewish people. He gave to them the law. But Moses is the one through who that law came. And so, you know, he, he's an extremely important individual in the... Uh, Jewish uh, history and, and in their Jewish religion. In fact, in John chapter 9 and verse 28, there were Jews in Jesus' day who were still professing, we be followers of Moses. You know, they're questioning somebody about, would you be a follower of Jesus? And, 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 and they're saying, we be followers of Moses. So Moses had his disciples even in the time of Jesus. He was a man well-loved and respected by the Jews, and, and he is the one that, that, that they're following. Uh, something else about Moses. Uh, three things that are mentioned about him in, in Deuteronomy 34, 10 to 12. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible says that since that time there had not arisen a prophet like Moses. And there were certain special things about Moses. But the prophecy is made that in time God's going to raise up a prophet like Moses. Now, if you look at Moses, the three things about him, the great lawgiver, he gave that law. But also there's a number of miracles that are associated with Moses during his time of service to God. Uh, not just the ten uh, of the, the miracles that he did down in Egypt in order to free them, but miracles that he did during the wilderness wanderings and providing for them food and drink and so forth. Uh, a lot of miracles that uh, were associated with it. Uh, but he was also a great deliverer. He had delivered them from bondage in Egypt and brought them into freedom. To that promised land that God had given to him. But now when you think about Jesus, who's brought up as a prophet like unto Moses, and you look at that, Jesus is a great lawgiver. He's given us a new law, the New Testament law for us. Uh, there are all the miracles that were associated with Jesus. Uh, numerous miracles that he did. Uh, and in, in John, it talks about many other miracles that Jesus are not written in this book. So there are numerous miracles that he did like that. But also there's the, the relationship uh, between Christ and God. The Bible says there in Deuteronomy of, of Moses uh, that there was not another prophet that knew God face to face. And God had talked about it. God said, when I talked to Moses, I talked to him face to face. And so Jesus comes along, and in the book of John, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That expression, the Word was with God, the idea is right up face to face with God. And so he has an even closer relationship to God than Moses did. Moses was a servant. Christ is the son. And so he's that prophet that God had promised to raise up that would be like Moses. And so Moses is a great man. There's no doubt about that. And I can understand that Peter in his excitement would want to build a tabernacle of this man also in honor of him. But then you've got Elijah there. Uh, I know in my mind, when I think about the great prophets, I usually think about, you know, looking at Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel. Uh, I think about people like Ezekiel, and then you can go through that whole list of, of the modern prophets that are, uh, that are given there. Uh, when you stop to think about that, who, who those great men? But Elijah never wrote a book 
Uh, there, he, he's what's called a non-literary prophet. But to the Jewish people, Elijah, uh, he, he was the head of all the prophets. He was the ideal type of man as a prophet of God. And they had great respect for him. And so here, here's Elijah on this occasion. He's there. Uh, you've got Moses the great law, lawgiver and Elijah the great prophet. And uh, listen, this is a, a statement that I took from uh, Brother Kaufman about this. And it just, you know, I never thought about this before. But he said, Moses the great lawgiver and Elijah the great prophet were summoned from the dead to resign their commissions and to lay down their homage at the feet of Christ never thought about it in that way God calls these two men back from the dead the great lawgiver the great prophet you know and they're giving up their commission and turning it over to Christ and, and when, when you think about this and what happens after this when you especially you look next to the testimony of God on this occasion when all this is happening Peter said Let, let's just build three tabernacles we want to honor Moses we want to honor Elijah and yeah, we want to honor Jesus too uh, but then when that happened it's when God spoke to them from a cloud. The Bible talks about that cloud that came over them. God spoke to them from the cloud. And, and what was mentioned a while ago, uh, there's so many times in the Bible where the cloud is used to represent God's presence among the people. It was there in leading them out of Egyptian bondage. In the daytime, he led them by that cloud, that pillar of cloud that would lead them through there. Uh, you come to the time of the, the building of the temple, and you look at it in 1 Kings chapter 8, and that temple is ready to be dedicated. And, and, and God comes into the temple as a cloud, the smoke that comes in there. And so the priests couldn't remain. They had to, to leave the temple uh, because God has come to take up residence there. But it's represented there as a cloud. And over and over again, you see that in, in the Old Testament. Uh, several of these verses here that, that I've mentioned we'll look at. Uh, Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. Uh, then in uh, Exodus chapter 40, in verse 34, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's the verse that, that Ben was talking about a while ago. Uh, that cloud, that represents the presence of God that covered that tent, that tabernacle. Uh, then in 1 Kings 8, 10, and 11, I mentioned, uh, when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so the priest could not stand to minister before the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And his presence there is represented by that cloud that comes into it. That's the presence of God. And so on this occasion, when, when this cloud overshadows them, and comes out over them, that's representing the very presence of God now among them. And, and, you know, imagine the effect that that would have had upon Peter and these other two apostles, uh, that this cloud comes upon them, and, and then God speaks to them out of that cloud. But there's something else I want to point out here. The triple behold. You've probably never heard of that before. I never had heard of it. Uh, and it depends which translation you're, you're reading from. But uh, if you look at it, uh, and I think... Uh, now, this may have come from the Revised Standard that does have it. But, but looking at it there in, in uh, Matthew chapter 17, uh, verses 3 to 5, and I've underlined these, it says, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, I will make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was yet speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That was the American Standard Version that I've taken from. Uh, the word behold, uh, th this is in the imperative. Uh, it's a command that's being given. And it simply means to uh, a command to see, to look at something. And so when the Bible talks about here, it's emphasizing, here's what you need to pay attention to. Here's what they needed to look at. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah. You've got the great law giver, and you've got the great prophet that are there. Uh, then in verse 5, while he was yet speaking, that is, while Peter's still talking about, let's build a tabernacle, I'll build the three tabernacles, that behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. 
And so this cloud comes down over them on that occasion. And then behold, again, command, look, uh, because there's a voice speaking out of that cloud. And that voice is God. And God is saying, this is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And so again, uh, the three beholds, the two witnesses that come down, Moses and Elijah, behold the bright cloud that overshadows them, and behold the voice of God speaking to them out of that cloud. Those are the things we need to give attention to. Uh, Moses, the great lawgiver, Elijah, the great prophet, but the time for listening to them has passed. And now it's time to listen to Jesus. Uh, I think we've talked about this before, and you've heard it many, many times, that uh, when Jesus was baptized, uh, God had said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he says the same thing here, except this time he adds two words. Hear him. And that's telling these prophets, or these apostles, the time for listening to Moses and the law, the time for listening to Elijah and what the prophets say, has passed. And now it's time to listen to my son. Uh, we, we talk about that so much when we study with people and use that little book that Jerry uh, wrote, to be, you know, for us to use in that. In Hebrews chapter 1, 1 and 2, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So today we, we speak and need to listen to Jesus and what he says. And that's why, you know, when people want to go back to the Old Testament to justify what they're doing, you know, that's not listening to what Jesus said. Now, when we want to go back to the prophets and see how prophets, those prophets commanded things to be done, that's not listening now to Jesus and what he's telling us today that we need to do. And that's what's being emphasized here. Now, after this, after God speaking, uh, now when this happens, what do these apostles do? They fell on their face. You know, again, I think fear here of this, what's happening. And because when God is through speaking and the cloud's taken up, then Jesus comes to them and, and he, he lays his hands on them and tells them to arise and be not afraid. Uh, you know, that fear has caused them to fall down. But now they're commanded to look. And when they look, what did they see? Only Jesus. Uh, uh, I thought I'd already gone through these. Come back to it. Okay, there it is. They saw no one but Jesus. Now again, here, here's a great lesson, I think, anyway, uh, for us today. Uh, that they saw no one but Jesus. Now just think about it. They've been frightened by what they've seen and what they've heard. They've fallen on the faces and Jesus tells them to rise and fear not. But remember now, they, they've just been hearing a message that tells them, you know, that law of Moses that you followed all your lives, that's no longer. The prophets of the Old Testament that you've listened to and learned from and, and you know, you've, you've done what they have commanded, that's been taken away. Now that's got to be a frightful thing Imagine if somebody came in and told you, if you had, a, had the voice of God speaking today to us, and he said, hey, church area, that's gone. Don't, don't pay any attention to the New Testament anymore. I've got something else I want to tell you. Uh, I don't know about you, but that would frighten me terribly. Uh, even if it's God truly speaking, and I know it's been, you know, I think, but that's what I've depended upon all my life. That's all I've ever known. That's all I've ever studied and followed. But there's encouragement there. Because after they've learned that that old law and the prophets is taken away and you're not to listen anymore, and you open it up, and Moses is not there anymore, and Elijah's not there anymore, but we still have Jesus. And that's the hope and the encouragement that's given to those apostles on that occasion. When they know the law and the prophets is taken away, they still have Jesus. And the same thing is true with us today. In all of our lives, we need to keep that constantly in our mind. You know, regardless of what happens, it doesn't matter whatever may occur to us in life. Whatever problems may come our way, whatever troubles there are, uh, just remember, we still have Jesus. Uh, and we don't have to worry about those things because he's always going to be with us. When everyone else is gone, we still have Jesus. I think about this past week, you know, uh, families have lost loved ones. And all of us have experienced that. There have been those times that you've lost those that you've loved and you depended upon, and they're gone. But you can take comfort in this. 
still have Jesus. You know, and, and it doesn't matter what problems occur in the life. There are always going to be problems that the church has. There are always going to be difficulties. Satan's always going to be fighting against us, trying his best to destroy us. But just remind yourself in those times of troubles, we still have Jesus. He hasn't left. He's not going to leave. Uh, and, and when these apostles open their eyes and they see no one, but still they have Jesus. Uh, think about uh, the law and the prophets are gone. You still have Jesus. Uh, I want to look at this case with Paul. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 16, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but they all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. How do you think Paul felt? He's in prison. He's there to stand trial there in Rome before uh, Caesar. Uh, and, and all of his friends have forsaken him. He doesn't have anybody there with him at that time. So how do you think he felt? Where would he get comfort for that? Verse 17, but the Lord stood with me. Everybody else is forsaking you, but you still have Jesus. No one else, you still have Jesus. It doesn't matter. And, and so when they open their eyes and they see no one but Jesus, that's the thing that hits me about this. It doesn't matter what happens in life. We still have it. When I talked about tonight about that those bonfires were built, you know, they eventually burn down and they're overcome by the darkness. But we have the light of the world that's an eternal light, and it'll never be overcome by this world and by the world of darkness. It'll always be the case. The Bible teaches us we will always have Jesus. Just like it was for those disciples, it will be for us. And then, this may be the last thing we get to talk about, Jesus says to them, Tell this vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now, why do you think Christ would give that command to them? Don't tell this vision to anyone until after I'm risen from the dead. I mean, I know there were a lot of times that Jesus gave these commands to people. You know, he'd heal somebody and he'd say, don't tell anybody about this. And the more tell them, the more they'd spread it abroad. You know, they couldn't keep quiet about it. But now, these apostles have just seen some exciting things and some things, you know, that are important. And you know they've got to be, you know, you ever been asked by somebody to keep a secret? You know, don't tell anybody about this. And how much you, especially if it's something good, boy, you just, oh, you want to tell it so bad, you can't hardly stand it. Well, that's the way they would have felt about this. But Jesus said, don't tell anybody until I've been risen from the dead. Well, why keep quiet for that period of time? All right, suppose you were one of the... Somebody start to say something. All right, yeah, he hasn't made... Okay, yeah, you know, he hasn't been put to death yet, so he hasn't obtained the salvation they need, and... And, and their hope of salvation can be dependent upon not what these apostles have seen here, but upon the death of Jesus. But also I think, uh, you know, imagine yourself, if, if you're one of the nine, okay? And these three have been with Jesus, and they've seen Moses, and they've seen Elijah, and they've heard God speak from heaven. And they come down and tell you, guess what you missed? You know, there may be, that may produce jealousy in the hearts of these other people. Why didn't we get to see that? Why, why have we been left out of that? We're apostles also. You know, that could be the case. It would cause jealousy. So that's not going to do any good. But now, if you wait until after Jesus has been risen from the dead, and then you start telling it. Number one, I think those apostles, those three apostles, they're about to explode anyway. They want, that, they want to be able to tell that good news to others. And, and they're going to be so excited that it's going to make it doubly sure that they're going to tell people now. When finally it's, it's free, Jesus has risen dead, now you can tell everybody about it. And they did. Now, we've talked about this before, but, but Peter wrote about it. Uh, well, I put, thought I'd put that passage up there. Let me just read that very quickly to you. He says, Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. That's in Second Peter chapter 1, uh, 
verses 16 through 18. Uh, so they did tell about it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, but when he's risen from the dead, that's when it could all begin, and that's when you can tell everybody about this. And this is going to be, again, this is great evidence and proof to them of who Jesus is. And that God has given his commendation of his son. And he's telling everybody, else, listen to him. And so that's going to be the message here. And that's going to help reach the Jewish people to understand that the law and the prophets has passed away. And now we're under the law of Christ. And we need to listen to what he says. Now, I'll say that our time just about gone. Uh, and that'll leave us at a good stopping place. The next section here in chapter 7 is going to deal with the healing of that epileptic boy. And this is what... Uh, we, we heard last Wednesday night about this and the situation there. And I, I told Jordan, I said, well, you, you pretty much covered everything I needed to say in my lesson on, on Sunday night. I said, you've already taken care of it. So uh, we won't go over it as, as much because uh, I think everything he said was valuable. It needed to be heard. But we may, may mention one or two things here about it. Uh, it be a, a, a little bit of addition maybe to what Jordan gave to us. But we're thankful for your being here. Let's, let's close out with a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank Thee for Your love and mercy that allows us to be together. And we're thankful, Father, for all these opportunities to, to be among our brothers and sisters and to be able to study together with them. We pray Your continued care and blessing upon us and upon Your church throughout this world. And help us, Father, never to give up. Help us to realize that that light of Christ still shines and that Christ will always be here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.